good evening to everyone all the participants who have joined this uh, master class uh, just before we get started let me just set the context um, as you know that uh, at thinkag we continuously look for solutions for the challenges that the tech ecosystem is facing so in that a uh, series we you know came across uh, that one of the challenges which a lot of tech entrepreneurs face is access to debt right and all of us know that is uh, very important uh, to drive scale of your operations and it also helps to grow without diluting your equity though we see a significant uh, increase in the venture capital uh, uh, looking to invest in tech i think debt continues to be a challenge and primarily because of the fact that you know conventional debt instruments require full laterals and a lot of equity tech startups uh, don't have capacity to give those full laterals so clearly we need to look for uh, uh, innovative solutions when it comes to debt financing and uh, you know to to discuss those solutions we uh, you know today have partnered with one of the leading players in the debt space uh, which is caspian debt and we are very fortunate to have uh, avishek avishek gupta uh, who is the invest investment director and head of caspian debt uh, avishek has enabled debt investments in more than 150 early to growth stage companies uh, as we all know caspian debt is a leader uh, to social enterprises and startups operating in multiple sectors including food and agriculture clean energy energy efficiency affordable housing healthcare financial inclusion and education so uh, we welcome abhishek uh, to this master class before i hand it over to him i also want to thank uh, our friends at rabo bank especially arindam who gave us this idea that why don't we do this master class so he kind of conceived it and he got caspian and us together Uh, to to conduct this master class so thanks arindam and all the rabo bank team uh, for for your support so with that i'll hand it over to abhishek uh, abhishek over to you thanks amy thank uh, thanks uh, thinkag team and of course the rabo foundation team uh, uh, good evening and welcome everybody uh, to the session uh, i'll just share my screen in a bit and uh, i'll start uh, okay uh abhijit is it possible to share the screen yeah thank you okay so yes so the uh, session today is uh it's called as a master class uh, and uh, we're going to talk about debt financing to agtech startups and before i start i want to make a promise Uh, and the promise is that by the uh, end of this session all of you who have joined this session will have the knowledge to build a more capital efficient company meaning that you will be able to achieve your long term goals of your company uh, while retaining slightly more uh, control over your business decisions and uh, probably retaining a little bit more of your uh, financial benefits uh, once your company succeeds so i'll focus on two two main areas uh, one area uh, of course uh, that i'll start off with is about how to raise from debt from alternate or new age sources when traditional sources of debt are not able to meet your debt requirements uh, which is what himendra hinted at the beginning of the session that while there are debt providers uh, given the nature of underlying uh, given the nature of ag tech companies it is not often uh, seen that uh, traditional lenders are able to meet the requirements so uh, caspian debt being an alternate lender and uh, uh, us having the experience of funded about 160 companies in total out of which i think about 35 are ag tech companies uh, we seem to have uh, got some understanding about how to go about raising debt and i will share some of that knowledge combined with uh, some of the knowledge that i've gained from uh, other sources and put it in the perspective of how the companies or ag tech startups can look at raising debt from sources like that of ours uh, not just caspian debt but so many other people 
secondly, what I'll try to cover is uh, the other sources of debt that are available. Uh, though it is uh, understood and known that the traditional or the other sources of debt are not easily available, uh, in various circumstances, they are actually available and suitable uh, if uh, you work towards them. So I'll try to kind of simplify as to when you should look out for them. Uh, this session... Abhishek, can you make it uh, full screen? Yeah. Is it... Go ahead. So, uh, and, and the slide reads who's the session for, right? Or uh, is it something else? Mother, can you confirm if the slide says who? Yeah, is this? yeah, we, we oh. can see the slide show. Yeah, okay. thank you. So this session is for those uh, entrepreneurs who want to build professionally managed businesses uh, that seek to grow fast uh, by raising external capital uh, because their profits may not be sufficient to achieve the speed of growth uh, that they want to achieve. Uh, we are also, the session is also targeted to those who are not willing to trade control of the business decisions uh, for access to this additional capital that they need for growth. Uh, there can be companies that may not want to or need to uh, or need not grow as fast and they may not need external capital. So whatever I say may not apply to them. So before I begin or talk about uh, how to raise debt, uh, you know, I think one of the key things that I would want to highlight to everybody is that uh, equity and debt, uh, both are external forms of capital and both serve a very important purpose in an ag tech company. However, the nature of financing, even though they are both money, is quite different. And the basic suggestion or advice that uh, we give to ag tech companies or startups in general is that you should raise debt only when you have predictable cash flows. Uh, for every other situation, equity is the right solution. So the purpose of this session here today is at not, no point of time to say that you should not raise equity. The point is you should raise equity and blend it with debt uh, if it is available to make your company more capital efficient. To give a very simple explanation of where to use equity and where to use debt, uh, you know, equity is long-term capital without any pre-agreed schedule of repayment. So it doesn't come with a repayment schedule, but there is a general understanding of when the equity investor would like to exit. Uh, but like I said, it doesn't come with a prefix schedule. Now, what that helps in is that when you have investments to make <clears throat> that do not lead to immediate cash flows or there is an uncertainty around the cash flows or when it will get generated, <clears throat> that is the time you use equity. With debt, uh, the moment you sign up on a debt uh, transaction, you co you're contractually required to repay under a fixed uh, kind of a pre-agreed schedule. And there may be a lot of flexibilities in the schedule, repayment schedule, but it is a pre-agreed repayment schedule. Meaning that whenever there is a repayment date and a repayment amount specified, specified on that date, you are contractually ob obligated to repay that amount on that date. Hence, the use of debt should be only in cases where cash flows are more predictable. So to give you a kind of an idea of the differences, equity should be used when you are, for example, using the money to develop a new product, file patents, or even the first cycle of revenue generation for your product or service. The debt product, however, is better used when, for example, you have got the product, it has sold the first cycle, and you are ready to scale. There is existing contracts available with you. Uh, and this applies to B2B companies, for example, in all those cases where you know that, okay, I have sold in the past and uh, this, the money will come in those kind of situations, uh, debt should be used. Now, having said that, uh, it is not easy to get debt because traditional sources of debt uh, do not provide funding to ag tech startups if your loan requirement is more than one crore. 
under situations when you do not have a mortgage collateral. So if you need a loan of more than one crore, which is what uh, fast growing uh, growth stage startups need, you need to have mortgage collateral or a resaleable asset uh, that you can use to give as collateral to uh, take the loan. In some cases, for example, in a new form of capital called venture debt that has come up, uh, they look to fund ag tech companies or startups. Uh, th that's how. That's why they're created. But what we've seen is that uh, those lenders also uh, provide funding in a very specific situation. And the specific situation is that you have a reputed, reputed venture capital investor uh, already, uh, you know, with you. So if you are a bootstrapped company or uh, if you have an equity investor who at least in the uh, uh, opinion of the venture debt provider is not reputed enough, uh, they will typically not fund you. And there are reasons for all of these uh, si situations. And lastly, and probably most uh, commonly, if you are not profitable, traditional lenders will not obviously fund you. When I say traditional, I'm talking about uh, you know, the normal banks and uh, traditional NBFCs. And I'll explain this in the later part of uh, the presentation, but what you will oddly see is that some lenders evaluate an asset, which may be a mortgage collateral, which may be a, a equipment. Uh, some lenders evaluate the counterparty uh, and some lenders evaluate your investor but very few lenders evaluate the core business itself. All these lenders do evaluate the business, but uh, they still want to have another fallback option. That fallback option typically is in the form of a mortgage. Uh, sometimes it is in the form of a strong counterparty buyer. Sometimes it is in the form of an equity investor. And a lot of ag tech companies may not have access to any of these given the nature of your business or uh, sometimes you may have one but you may not have others and that one criteria does not allow you to raise a lot of capital uh, per se so what do you do the one key thing that all of you have is that you have information information about your business information that can establish that you are a solid business that can be provided debt. For that, you need to be willing to share that information with the lenders who take decisions based on the core business, who take decisions based on uh, the verifiable information that the companies are providing to them because for them, they don't have a mortgage to fall back on. They don't may not have profitability of the company to fall back on. They may not have a reputed VC investor to fall back on. So the only thing that they can, those kind of lenders can fall back on is the data on the company, verifiable data. And that is where entities like Caspian Debt plays a role. We try to evaluate companies based on the actual or the core business potential or the core business performance. And I'll give you a little bit of a detail on what aspects Caspian debt uh, looks at closely. And once I'm through with this, I'll also cover or give you some details on how, what the other sources of debt uh, look at as well, because at the end of the day, uh, if, if it is still not clear, what I'm trying to get at is that uh, for different situations and for different stages of life of the company, uh, there are different lenders or types of lenders or products that are available. As, a, as an ag tech company, you are better off being aware of all those options available and approaching uh, these solutions depending on the situation that you are in because that is going to help you get access to the right kind of debt at the right time. So going back to the types of lenders who evaluate the company per se and don't depend, uh, don't lend based on mortgage collateral or some other asset uh, or profitability or venture capital investor, because a lot of ag tech companies we know don't have all of them. 
or do not meet some of the criteria. So what do we look at? What does Caspian Debt or entities like Caspian Debt look at? We look at uh, broadly four areas. There are a lot of details into this, but broadly, if I categorize the different things that we look at, it consists of the quality of the governance and the management. <clears throat> We look at the business and the operations risk that the entity or the ag tech company faces. We look at the quality of the processes and systems. And of course, we look at the financial performance. Now, if I am to dig a little deeper into this, uh, like I said, there are several points. And if you look at, for example, the uh, evaluation framework that Caspian uses, we have 65 to 75 parameters that we use, which kind of covers different aspects of all these points that I mentioned, but I'll kind of talk about a few of them, which will give you an understanding of what we are looking for. The first thing is data transparency. Uh, what we expect is that the company has to be able to share MIS reports going back at least 12 months. Uh, such uh, that kind of an MIS report expected to cover details like say, for example, revenues, expenses, your receivables, track record, and so on. And why is this important? It is important because, like I said, lenders who are considering to lend without mortgage collateral, without a uh, three-year profitability, uh, without a, even in a situation when there is the company is bootstrapped, it is necessary for us to get something else, and that is this MIS, uh, which is very important for us. It is also important that uh, some of the data that you submit is verifiable. So for example, uh, and at least one year of audited financials with revenues, operating revenues in the business that you are in uh, is necessary because without that, it's very, very difficult to verify uh, the actual performance of the company uh, or you wouldn't have enough track record. Luckily for us today, a lot of developments have happened in the verifiable information area. So today, for example, you can share your bank statements or you can share your GST statements with lenders like us and say that, look, this is how you can also verify whether uh, my MIS is correct or whatever I'm claiming is correct. The third thing is revenue certainty. Uh, like I mentioned right in the beginning that you should debt take debt only when there is, uh, you have cash flow certainty. The first step towards cash flow certainty is revenue certainty. And that comes from, for example, for B2B companies, it is existing orders in hand and uh, past track record of having executed on those orders and the counterparty having paid you on those orders. If you have that kind of a track record, having new orders in hand gives, uh, you know, indicates revenue certainty. In an ideal situation, operating cash, I mean, the company has to be cash flow positive because only then you can uh, repay the loan. This is especially necessary for bootstrap companies. However, in case of venture-backed companies, venture capital equity-backed companies, uh, those kind of companies take an uh, kind of a strategic decision or uh, what you call a strategic choice to focus on growth first rather than uh, profitability in the earlier days because they want to grow fast that's how the venture capital investor will uh, you know reap uh, uh, returns and the uh, entrepreneur will also uh, reap returns now that's a very different strategy from the traditional way of uh, running businesses. So these companies may be cash flow, cash negative. So should they raise funds? The answer is, should they raise debt? The answer is yes, but only if, and here is the detail that only if the unit economics of the company or the business model is established. If your unit economics is not established, your business model is not clear, uh, in that kind of a situation, even if you have equity backing, you should not look to raise debt because without an ex established business model, without an existing revenue certainty, uh, there is no way you can predict when you will get cash flows. And hence, in those circumstances, you should not borrow. 
But if you have a proven business model, unit economics are proven, but you're still making losses just because you are spending uh, much more, meaning that you may be a three crore, five crore to add annual revenue company, but you've hired a very senior marketing person or you are spending money to uh, build technology that is more appropriate for a 500 crore turnover, but you're making that investment or expense today because you will, you know that you will get to that 500 crore turnover within two years or three years. And the venture capital equity investor is ready to kind of fund that cash flow mismatch. In those circumstances, uh, you can raise debt as well. So you need to be both unit economics proven and you have a venture capital investor backing you. In those kind of situations, you can take a loan without being operating cash flow positive. Viability of the business in the medium to long run is important. So for example, gross margins of the business, the kind of buyers you have, how much diversified the buyers are, the quality of relationships with the suppliers, uh, and of course, the competitive landscape is important. One of the key things that we have observed as far as ag tech companies is concerned is that ag tech companies by design are supposed to be, uh, you know, creating a completely new, uh, you know, ex kind of exploring a completely new opportunity with the use of technology. In a lot of situations, uh, that uh, opening up of the opportunity to the maximum scale would take some time because it, it is about shifting markets. It is about shifting habits. It is about shifting uh, the practices and existing supply chains. That doesn't happen overnight. Now that shift, if it happens, it actually leads to a very, uh, you know, uh, big outcome, financial outcome for the startups. And the venture capital investors. And that is the reason why they invest. They don't care about what happens in the next month. But if the business with the technology has the ability to disrupt things three years down the line or five years down the line, they make an investment thinking that because of this disruption that may take three to five years, uh, you know, I will result in significantly positive financial returns. And I'll also enable myself to get significant for those who care about social impact. Uh, I will also get significantly positive social impact out of this investment, but I don't care whether I, if I get it tomorrow or day after, because it will come to me three or five months later. And I need to understand the technology well to be able to say that, yes, it will happen three or five years down the line. So the equity investor will evaluate the claim that this technology will actually re result in the valuation growth. Now, the funny thing with lenders, of course, is that lenders do not cannot wait for three to five years. If they have to wait for that long for the money to come back, uh, it means that it's almost equivalent of equity. Lenders want the money to start coming back probably next month or probably the next quarter if there is a moratorium. I mean, they may give you a three-year or a five-year term loan, but the money has to start coming back in the next month or the next quarter. In case of equity, they can wait much longer. They can have all the money come back three years or five years later. Now, what this means, especially relevant to the ag tech companies, is that while you may have a very sophisticated and a breakthrough technology, if it doesn't result in immediate cash flows or it doesn't result in cash flows one month or three months down the line, there is no point in selling the, uh, you know, the benefits of the technology to a lender typically. You should, of course, mention how it is going to change things uh, in future because that gives confidence to the lender that this is a high quality business. But if you, you cannot assume that because of this quality of technology, a lender will lend to you. An equity investor will invest in you because of the quality of the technology. But a lender will lend to you if the quality of the technology is good, plus it results in cash flows in the near future. If it doesn't lead to cash flows in the near future, no matter how uh, breakthrough your technology is, it doesn't really help a lender to take a positive decision. And I'm mentioning this and taking a little bit more time on this because a lot of active entrepreneurs in our experience uh, have 
uh, are, are typically uh, you know very gung ho about the technology this they they find it difficult to understand why even though their technology is so breakthrough this lender is so dumb not to consider it point is they are not dumb uh, they don't get any benefit out of uh, this technology because they want the money back in the next 3 months uh, starting the next 3 months even if they give you a 5 year term loan so i would request all uh, entrepreneurs agtech entrepreneurs to keep this in mind one big benefit that agtech entrepreneurs typically have is that the gross margins in the business are typically significantly higher than the traditional agri businesses that gives a lot of comfort to lenders one of the other things that we have seen happen and this is also something that a lot of you have to be careful about is that the expectation for a tech business is to have solid gross margins and when i say solid i'm talking about north of 30% or maybe 25% if you have gross margins of 10% or 15% i am not too sure whether it's a uh, you know tech business per se or even if you are a tech business it is probably viable only at a much larger scale you know maybe 100 200 crores in that kind of situation uh you know you have to really evaluate whether you are a real ag tech company or you are a traditional company using a little bit of a tech and make a presentation to the lender accordingly not to kind of think that a lender will consider me only if i am ag tech moving on relevant experience of the promoter is important meaning that uh, the promoters or the key managerial persons in the company uh, in our opinion should have a minimum of 3 years of relevant experience now why is that important uh, are we saying that uh, people who come from a different industry are not suitable to disrupt because example say that that is always the case uh, we are not saying that that is untrue we are not saying that people coming from a different industry or experience uh is not are not successful in this business they are successful in the business but are they uh, do they uh, unless they have the experience to make sure that there is revenue and cash certainty in the business it doesn't help and typically that kind of a situation comes with some minimum years of experience and when i say experience it could be a combination of uh, both uh academic experience or uh, you know work experience experience in the same startup for 3 years also is fairly useful because you would have actually gone through the pains of understanding the same business for which you are raising debt credit bureau history of the company and the uh, promoters of the business so if you have not bought, taken a loan that's okay but if you if the company has taken a loan in the past and there are current overdues or past write offs typically no lender would consider uh, lending to that kind of a company there are some specialized lenders who lend in distress situ situations they may consider but otherwise if you have a loan and there are current overdues or past write offs it is a bad situation to be in for from the perspective of raising further debt if you do not have loans that is a better situation compared to the situation that i just said the same thing applies for the promoters as well now why is it important that the promoters have a good credit score when the borrower is actually the company the reason why it matters is because the company at the end of the day especially an early stage growth stage company is essentially an extension of the promoter as far as uh, the their mindset of uh, repayment of debt is concerned so in a way the promoter's credit score is a proxy of for how in all possibility the company is going to be serious about repaying debt on time and that is why this score becomes important aspects like cash management or credit history for example if you are issuing checks for making payments to your uh, suppliers too many check bounces is actually a bad sign 
meaning that either you are not serious about making payments to your suppliers or you are not able to manage your cash flows both of which is not a good sign from a repayment of debt perspective collections rigor now this is important for ag tech companies because like i have been saying is that what i've been saying is that the ag tech companies focus on growth first meaning they focus on billing revenues but the company i mean there's no point in the revenue if you don't make the collections if if you uh, sell a product or deliver a product to a customer and that customer says that they will pay you 30 days or 60 days later and you never get that money that revenue is useless and what often happens in a lot of ag tech companies or startups that are focused on growth is that they focus a lot on the revenue but a lot of the times collections takes a back seat and the companies that are successful actually have specific people looking at collections on a daily and a weekly basis so we try to look for companies that have this focus they understand that billing booking revenues only is not the solution or end of it you have to find a way to make collections as well otherwise there's no use quality of internal controls whether you maintain proper books of accounts financial transactions that you've done uh, record of your inventory if you have or receivables aging order book all these when 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 we ask for it is it easily available and is there proof that uh, somebody in the senior management is regularly looking at all these things it's important statutory filings like say for example if you have tax payable or e pf pensions or any other statutory payments that you have to make are you making those on time and are you making the filings on time both a lot of you may wonder that you know we're talking about ag tech we are talking about changing the world we are talking about disrupting the supply chains uh, we are talking about changing lives and here uh, i am talking about boring things like credit history cash management collections rigor internal controls statutory filings this is so boring the funny thing is that while it is boring this is what decides whether your company is going to scale or not whether your company is going to be that company that is able to fulfill the promise and excitement that you created when you first developed your technology the promise with which you attracted custom new customers or employees or investors even are you able to fulfill that promise and you are able to fulfill that promise only if you are a large scaled company and that won't happen unless you have these boring things in place so it sometimes it actually pays to be boring and sometimes it makes it easier for a lender to make a loan as well i'll move on to the other forms of debt and so what i was talking about till now is the typical way in which lenders like us or lenders like caspian debt who do not look for mortgage collateral are ready to provide financing up to 15 or 20 crores uh, are ready to provide loans to loss making companies uh, are ready to uh, provide a very high level of flexibility in the product structures what do lenders like that evaluate uh, typically and what are the key areas that we look for so that is what i was describing till now what i want to talk about is the other options of debt that is available like i said in the beginning the purpose of this session is not to say that equity is not necessary equity is necessary equity capital is necessary in specific circumstances and of course debt is known as it is necessary what i also said was that there are different kinds of debt products and sources of debt products as an ag tech company you should evaluate when any of these situations are there in your company your purpose is to get debt for your business because that helps you make that helps make you more capital efficient and for that you should not just evaluate caspian debt but you should also evaluate other options wherever it is 
uh, it meets your requirement. And there are lots of types of debt available and it sometimes may sound complicated and you know difficult to understand. But if I really simplify everything and this is how I look at things uh, and I, uh, different people may have different ways of looking at this, but if I simplify the, all the different types of debt available, I can broadly classify it in three, three categories. One is asset-based loans, meaning that the lender will, of course, evaluate your business, but they actually lend with the expectation that if something goes bad, I will liquidate the asset that I have and get my money back. So they lend based on you know, property or mortgage collateral. They lend based on equipment that is saleable. They lend based on stock that is saleable. Now, the key thing here for asset-based lenders is that the underlying asset has to have good resale value. That is number one. And number two is that it should, uh, I mean, the, the amount that the lender has made a loan, the asset has to cover more than that. Meaning that if the company does not is, is not able to repay the loan, they have the ability to sell the asset and get the money. Now, one specific thing that I want to mention here is that uh, while good, the value is important, the resaleability is even more important. Meaning that you may have a property of a very high value or an equipment of a very high value, but if the lender doesn't consider it to be resaleable, they will typically not make the loan. So if you are looking for an equipment loan or a loan against a property, you have to be sure that it is both resaleable, uh, of course, both of good value and resaleable. Second type of loans is typically the transaction-based lending, meaning bill discounting, supplier-based supplier financing. In these kinds of circumstances, what happens is that the lender evaluates the counterparty, your buyer or your supplier, And if your buyer has a better credit rating and typically had the bank or the lender has relationships with them, they will provide the funding because they are kind of evaluating not you, but the counterpart. Similar with supplier financing. A lot of the times the suppliers have better credit standing than the ag tech companies. In those kind of situations, the lender may be comfortable financing the supplier, which takes care of the working capital requirements of the supplier and they don't demand money from you sooner. The last and more slightly more modern option is the venture debt, which is more, which is a situation where a lender provides you with the money or the debt when you have a reputed venture capital, institutional venture capital investor. They don't typically fund you when you are bootstrapped or you have an equity investor who is not considered reputed in their opinion. What they evaluate is the ability of the reputed venture capital equity investor to bring in more capital if the company needs the capital or to crowd in more equity investors uh, when there is a need for the company to get further equity. Oh, sorry. So here's the thing. I talked about three other options of debt beyond the type of debt that, for example, a Caspian debt type of an organization provides by evaluating the core business of the company. Here are three other forms of debt, but as life would have it, the lenders do not evaluate the core business performance of the company as much. They do that evaluation, but they expect they, they actually lend based on comfort of something completely different. Asset-based lenders lend based on the underlying asset. Transaction-based or bill discounting lenders lend based on counterparty evaluation. Venture debt providers lend based on your equity investors evaluation. They don't, none of these people lend based on your evaluation, which means that the amount customization of the loan uh, and the suitability of the loan may not always match your requirements, but they do meet or serve an important purpose uh, and should be considered at different points of time. So to give you an example of some of the other, I mean, I mentioned the types, but to give you a little bit more details, what are they, you know? So, and these would, uh, 
these other so so for example if if you are selling through a e-commerce platform or if you are selling on an electronic platform and your transactions are recorded a lot of fintech lending uh, companies provide loans up to 2 lakh uh, up to 10 lakhs through a cash flow trap mechanism say you are selling inputs through an online platform and the online platform has got into a tie up with a fintech lender and you need a small amount of loan they can provide that there are small business term loan providers as well both on the nbfc side and the fintech side they will provide slightly larger loans sometimes they do unsecured but typically they will cap out at 30 lakhs or 20 lakhs actually they expect you to be profitable a slightly uh, bigger amount of loan is available from the same people typically the traditional nbfc is a what you call a loan against property and there what they'll do is they'll make a loan based on 50 to 60 percent of the value of the property nothing to doing nothing doing about the business this is typically slightly costly costly one other option that we have seen a lot of entrepreneurs use is take a mortgage loan if they have a personal property housing property from a bank which typically comes at a cost which is near a home loan rates near but higher and they also get it at a for much longer tenor and they take that money into the business but these options this option is available only to those who have personal property which is not the case in most first generation uh, entrepreneurs that we work with at least at the beginning of their uh, you know startup journey the other option is uh, uh, one very useful option is cgt msc uh, loans from banks where loans or exposures debt up to two crores is available from banks uh, you don't need to provide mortgage collateral you typically don't need to be profitable you have to be an sme as per definition and there are a few government related criteria that you need to match uh, the only trouble is that it's not very easy to get uh, it takes you a lot of patience to get to that and the problem is that if your debt requirement in future goes above two crores the same bank will not provide that amount of funding to you because the for a larger amount of funding it is not covered by the scheme this cgt msc scheme and for a larger amount of funding the bank will go back to its normal method of operation which is they will lend only with mortgage collateral and three year profitability so these are the other options that you have or that you can consider for different ticket sizes or different kinds of situations if uh, you know, beyond uh, the likes of uh, Caspian debt. So to end this, uh, if I were to summarize, I would say this, I, mean, I, I would end with these four points. So, you know, building a strong business or an ag tech company is primary. Uh, raising funds from external sources is actually incidental. If you know, you should raise the funds from external sources, whether it is equity or debt, only if you believe that you are able to return the money and because your business has the ability or is it strong to return the money. In some cases, of course, like using the money for R&D and uh, developing new products, you may have to raise the money to make sure that you are able to develop the product. Uh, but typically, raising external money should happen only if you believe that you can return the money. Second, money is fungible. Like I said, equity and debt both give you money, but the usage of them and the expectations of usage for, of them are very different. And it matters because in a way, the risks that both these capital providers take are very different and their expectations are very different. And hence, the way you use the money or what use you put the money into uh, that is something that you should be careful about. What interestingly, a lot of entrepreneurs come back and tell us is that for those who've actually been able to figure out this nuance, understand this nuance well, some people have actually uh, 
decided that working capital requirements or cases where I will have immediate cash flows, I will fund only with debt. And for everything else, I will use, use equity. To the extent that some people have just kept aside money, even if they have funds for uh, you know, lying in the bank, they will not use it for working capital purposes. Some people are so uh, specific. What and, and entrepreneurs tell us that this clarity of being uh, clear about where, uh, why the usage of money is important has helped them build a more disciplined business and it has helped them scale up better. The third point is that each and every investor or lender or grant funder, whatever you're tapping, there is a big universe of these people. It is not that everybody should be your target. You should do a little bit of a research on who is the appropriate type of a funder for a situation. Uh, like I tried to explain for debt a little earlier uh, and then approach them. Everybody has a different business model and risk appetite or a mandate. So for them, uh, for, because of those reasons, you should not target everybody. And lastly, look for a partner in this, especially in the early and growth stages because in the early and growth stages, uh, you won't always have a smooth ride, predictable ride. There are bumpy rides. And it helps if you have people who work like partners and you are not transactional with them. A lot of proactive information sharing helps. A lot of uh, you know working together helps in the early and growth stages. Once you're larger, transactional relationships are fine to have. This is not to say that, uh, you know, a lender will uh, be okay with a default. The answer is no. But then, you know, there are chances of if you are proactive, the lender can work with you and give you a little bit more time for, to help you to recover or provide you with more funding to help you recover or understand why there is a stress and try to help you with connects or references that can help you either raise money or uh, you know get more business. So you should consider all these aspects when you uh, raise funds. Before I end, what uh, we will do is that I obviously could not cover all the details of uh, the nuances of debt funding. We have created a handbook for entrepreneurs like you. Uh, we will send that out. I will request the ThinkAg team to share that with all the entrepreneurs in the audience and anybody else who's interested. For, if you are interested beyond this, please write to us at info at caspian.in. We'll be happy to share this handbook with you. That's all for, from me for now. Himandu. Thanks, Abhishek. It's been a Fabulous uh, presentation. I think it gives a lot of clarity to all the entrepreneurs on uh, when to use debt, when to use equity, and even on debt, I think you have uh, given a very good uh, framework in terms of how to go about it. So thanks very much, Abhishek. Uh, maybe one or two questions, if I may ask uh, at this stage. I think even in AgTech, if you look at, there are two kind of startups. One is which are more focused on supply chain solutions like uh, building farm to fork linkages or let's say building a direct to farmer model, you know, essentially selling inputs. So that's one category. Another, which is more like product startup where we have, let's say company working on robotics or image processing and stuff like that. And in the first case, you can predict some cash flows. In the second case, it's very difficult when you're in a product development cycle. So how do you evaluate these two cases? I'm sure there are differences in the way lender would look at it. Yeah. So, uh, no, so a very good question, Himendra. So, uh, in fact, uh, uh, you're right. For the second case, where it's a product development company, it is difficult to gauge cash flows. And typically what we've seen is that, uh, it, uh, at least in our uh, opinion, uh, it is dangerous for such companies to raise debt early when their product is not developed. Uh, it is more appropriate that they should, uh, but what happens is that after the product is developed, they need to sell and they're, 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 you know, what, 
what we've seen often happen is that a lot of these companies once the product is proven the pilot rounds have gone great which is typically funded by equity there is a sudden large order that they can't meet and uh, unfortunately if the, if debt is not available in that kind of circumstance where the sale is proven and the buyer is interested uh, if you don't raise debt there you end up with the chance of diluting uh, your shareholding by raising equity those are the kind of situations that when these kind of product company should should raise debt and i think the good part you know once they reach that stage these kind of companies are more attractive for a lender because the margins are much better than the other type of companies that you're talking about so i think there are benefits for a lender to work with both the companies at different stages great uh, and the second question i have is in case of venture debt uh what kind of comfort do you seek with the existing investors you know are they supposed to give you some sort of guarantees or you know what is what are those two or three things which you seek from them yeah so uh so venture debt is one of the products that we provide as caspian debt uh and that product essentially involves a small warrant or an options component typically say 10 to 15% of the loan amount Uh, comes in as a warrant component or an options component meaning that uh, we will have some right to uh, purchase some equity shares and sell it to make a higher return to compensate for the lower coupon but that is one product that we offer there is no formal commitment from the equity investor per se it's more of uh, you know we evaluate the equity investor in that case and their track record uh before we do those transactions uh but what we've seen is that uh, venture debt only product may not be the suitable product in all cases of ag tech or all cases of the other sectors that we work in uh, especially because we are an impact focused uh, lender uh that that valuation uptick or the extra returns because of the valuation kicker uh equity kicker may not happen in all cases so we've figured out a way that we make normal term loans and uh, you know cash credit kind of revolving facilities uh, for even companies that are loss making so uh, and and that is where a lot of these ad, you know additional evaluation based on the information that we get from the companies becomes important uh, so uh, from that perspective when a agtech company is evaluating the options for debt uh, it i think we have busted the myth that uh loss making companies can only get access to venture debt with equity uh returns uh in specific situations uh, the lender may be able to evaluate the risk and make a loan without taking warrants uh but you know the information requirements requirements are more the interest rate may sound like more or it may be like you know initially the interest rates are lower over a period of time it goes up and so on those kind of adjustments may have to be made right can i ask my last question is you know you given that to so many tech companies can you talk about your experience you know or if there are any do's and don'ts you talk some of those in your presentation also uh but you know if if you have any suggestion for for the entrepreneurs who are on the call yeah so uh, i think uh, the best people uh, uh is probably the entrepreneurs but i'll tell from what uh, my perspective what i have seen i think the uh, transparency uh, of uh, information sh- sharing information is something that is very pro- positive proactively saying you know uh, whenever we talk to uh, entrepreneurs the typical conversation that we have is bad news has to come first uh, good news can wait if that approach is taken i think it helps a lot and like i was saying uh, for a lender uh, even if your technology is breakthrough uh, it doesn't matter beyond a point what really matters is yes i appreciate as a lender that the technology is breakthrough but can it generate cash three months down the line what is going to generate cash three months down the line tell me about that so i think that approach helps collections focus on collections is very important uh a lot of uh, companies focus on revenues and never focus on collections i think that's what we've seen successful companies do i mean to tell you the truth we have worked with uh, i mean we've been doing this for 7 years now right so just to name a few 
uh, companies because it's out in the public. So we've we've been working with uh, companies like EcoZen from the time they were like I think three or four crores of turnover. Uh, we've uh, we've worked with companies like Stell Apps, uh, which again I think we started working with them since the time they were like three four years. We've worked with companies like Promethean. Uh, we've worked with uh, you know there are like I said there are thirty or thirty five more companies that we work with. One common theme across all of them that we've seen is that uh, the promoters understand clearly that working capital should be financed by debt and they kind of compartmentalize it in their heads, making sure that they use debt or try to get debt from different sources to be able to grow by uh, uh, you know, reaching out to all these debt providers and not just limiting to equity. So I think that approach also helps. And because of that, they prepare and they prepare how they'll share information. They prepare how their internal controls are, systems are. And uh, I think that helps them grow faster. Okay, great. Uh, I think there are one or two audience questions. I would request them, them to post on the chat box. Uh, Abhijit, can you ask them to put it on the chat box? Yeah, I mean, there are asked. Or I don't know if they can ask the question. That's also okay. Yeah, I can. I can do that also. Yeah, can you do that in the interest of time? Yeah, Guru Raj has raised his hand. Go ahead, Guru Raj. What's your question? He's on mute. Raj, are you there? Okay. Uh, I don't think we can hear him. So maybe we can uh, take it offline. And with that, uh, I want to thank Abhishek. And uh, now I'll request Arindam uh, for his closing remarks. Arindam, first of all, many thanks from the entire ThinkTech team for making this masterclass happen. Uh, request you for your closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Hemendra. Uh, thanks for the wonderful uh, presentation, Abhishek. Now, it's very, very important with the number of active companies we have in India, more than 1,000, that you know different sources of capital are made available for the disruptions which is getting promised in the market. And it's very, very important from the demand side to also understand the different facets and nuances of different kind of capital. And I think Abhishek gave a very good definition or you know helped us understand what a good capital structure for a company is, when to go for debt and when to go for equity. And that's critical. What we have seen in the Indian market, especially for, for small businesses, there's not a lot of you know uh, knowledge about when to reach out to what kind of capital and within that capital pool, which are the organizations to reach out to. The good part about India and it's unique, I repeat that in spite of all the financial non-inclusion story we hear that niche organizations like Caspian and many others impact funds, which are there for health, education, agriculture, et cetera, which make a huge impact. Such an ecosystem is not there in other parts of the world. So it's very, very important to be able to understand the key and niche role they play before businesses become mainstream and large to be able to engage with formal financial institution. And the good part is, there are multiple large organizations, multilats and others who are backing a lot of these impact funds and niche MBFCs through different kind of products and large program. And they are increasingly increasing the exposure to India and especially to agriculture and ag tech. We should hear about larger programs in the next three to six months being rolled out. And it's extremely important that on the demand side, we get it right on how to make ourselves, uh, how to prepare ourselves to be debt ready, how to help the debt providers under, you know, uh, underwrite the risk. And the most important part, I think, was what Abhishek 
said in the last statement that new companies, nascent companies, disruptors should look for partners and not only for sources of finance because a, a, a knowledgeable financing institution not only comes in with capital, but it also comes in with a lot of knowledge about the sector, knowledge about the ecosystem with a large network, which helps the, the, the business to grow or to make useful connections in the sector to be able to do its business better. So uh, thanks once again, Abhishek. I think that was wonderful. And I, the devil is always on the details. We look forward to the handbook. And I'm sure it will be very, very useful for the entrepreneurs, not only in the active sector, but across the technology sector, making impact to make India a better place to live in. And I would also like to thank Himindra, especially Abhishek, uh, Abhijit from the Think Act team, who did all the heavy lifting to get this together. And a big shout to all the entrepreneurs, all the very best, because capital is available. It's not only equity capital. And we are lucky, again, I say in India, that a lot of you know, specialized capital is available through a lot of these niche and wonderful institutions that India has. And to be able to, you know, work with all of you to be able to do the right kind of disruption to make agriculture more profitable, not only for the farmers, but also for the consumers and for the nutrition security of the country and the world. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rindam. And clearly, Rabo Bank and Mix of Caspian had a huge role to play in making that capital available to entrepreneurs. I think without your effort, I don't think we have reached this stage. And we sincerely look forward to those larger pools of capital, which you mentioned. I'm sure <laughs> that will take the ecosystem to the next level. But thanks very much for all the good work that uh, you are doing. And uh, thanks to the Caspian team for for partnering with us. It has clearly given a good direction to everyone. I am hopeful the entrepreneurs on the call benefited a lot. I hope Avishay, you're going to get a few deals <laughs> very soon after this call. Uh, so thanks very much for, for this uh, support and participation. And I thank all the participants, all the entrepreneurs on the call. If you have any questions which is unanswered, please feel free to reach out to any one of us. And stay tuned for the next masterclass. Uh, we are going to announce it very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Amitra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.